Good morning, and welcome to the sanctuary of Cornerstone Assemblies of God. I am Pastor Richard T. Wade, and I would like to say thank you for joining us today. I pray the Word of God can speak to you, and the Holy Spirit make it real to you. Now, a pre-recorded message from Cornerstone Assemblies of God. Take your Bibles and turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. We'll be looking verses 1 through 11 this morning. I've entitled this message, Do You Not Know? Do You Not Know? I'll answer that question in just a moment. Do you not know what? Well, just hang tight. Do you not know? I'm really excited about what the Spirit of God is doing throughout our region. I'm loving the testimonies and what I'm hearing and seeing. God is on the move. He's still a right now God, answering right now prayers, making himself known. Last night, the Spirit of God moved in this place, and we prayed for the sick, and I spent a few moments testifying about healings that's taken place within our own house of worship. And after the service, Brother Jesse Cook came to me, and he goes, man, he goes, I've, I've taken time, Pastor, to tell you about some struggles I'm having and to tell you about some things that's going on in prayer requests, but I've not told you that when I started coming to church here 10 months ago that I was battling seizures, and they were looking at taking my driver's license because I just was having grand mal seizures. I was actually stopping breathing I would wake up and have vomit on my pillow because I'd had such a a violent seizure in my sleep that I had vomited all over the bed and didn't even realize it he says but I wanted to just testify that since I've came here I have not had one seizure and I've just amen amen and he went on to say, because he just, he had tears in his eyes, and he says, you know, I've known that I've not had a seizure, obviously. He said, but tonight, as we prayed and we believed God for healing, he says, I just felt a confirmation in my spirit. The Lord told me, he says, you don't have to walk in this fear anymore. It is done. You're healed. And so he says, I just wanted to testify that I hadn't had a seizure in 10 months, and the Lord has confirmed in my spirit that I'm not going to have any more. Glory to God. Glory to God. I've had other testimonies. I don't have permission to share them publicly. I don't know if everybody knows some of the situations. But, uh, hey, some things are going on. Pray. Well, the Lord healed. I'm not having that problem no more. So, praise God for that. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, starting in verse 1. I'm going to read verses 1 through 8, and then we'll go further. Dare any of you, having a matter against another, go to the law before the unrighteous and not before the saints? Do you not know that the saints will judge the world? If the world will be judged by you, are you unworthy to judge the smallest matters? Do you not know that we shall judge angels? How much more the things that pertain to this life? If then you have judgments dealing with matters of this life, do you appoint as a judge those who are least esteemed in the church? I speak to your shame. Is it true that there is not even one wise man among you who shall be able to judge between his brothers? But brothers go to the law against brother and before unbelievers at that. Now, therefore, it is already an utter failure for you that you go to the law against one another. Why not rather just be wrong? Why not rather be defrauded? But you yourselves do wrong and defraud. 
and do this to your brothers. So in these eight verses, Paul is dealing with grievances within the household of faith. I don't want to spend a whole lot of time here, but I'm going to spend some time here. (laughs) Verse 5, Paul says, shame on you (laughs) that you have issues one with another, small things within the church, and you'd rather, they're, they're suing one another. They're going to the worldly courts and coming about situations against people who are supposed to be their brothers in the faith. And Paul's like, what, is, what are you doing? Can't you handle your own business? How is it you're trusting the world? And here's where we're going to go with this. You're trusting the world to give you judgment on what is right and wrong. Do you not know that if you are in right relationship with Christ, returning with him in righteous robes, that you are the very ones alongside with Christ who will pass judgment on the world? That you will pass judgment even upon angels? Do you not know your spiritual authority? Do you not know who you are in the kingdom of God? How dare you worry with the opinion of the world? And that's what I want to talk to you about this morning. Do you not know who you are? Do you not realize that if you are born again Christian, you are a joint heir with Christ Jesus, that you are seated with him in heavenly places, that he has given you authority, he's given you the keys to the kingdom, that the gates of hell shall not prevail against you. What well, says the church? Guess what you are? The church. Do you not know who you are? What I've come to learn is we don't want to go to brothers and sisters in faith to fuss about the things that are irritating us because they might share with us the Word of God. But if I put it on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram, every other person in the world can affirm my pity party they can make me feel good in my weaknesses they can help affirm me being out of order Paul's like why are you making all this mess public they didn't have Facebook Instagram then they was just going to the courtroom Paul says, of course, I'm saying Paul because Paul is the one who wrote this, but this is through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. God is telling you here, the power of God is saying, why? Why? The word shame and utter failure are used in the modern English version dealing with this situation. It is a shame and an utter failure that the church can't even handle its own business. Goes on to say, How about instead of causing a ruckus, you just, how about you be uncomfortable for a little while? How about you just swallow up the loss and take it? In the name of peace. To keep unity and things at bay. How about you just be unhappy? Boy, that goes over like a lead balloon. Because we in the American church, we've gotten so fleshly driven that it's all about my comfort. It's all about what makes me happy, what tickles my fancy. This is how I want it. Make it my, we we think this is Burger King. You don't get it your way. (laughs) That's, That's not it. Do not take church grievances to the world. If your brother and sister in faith does you wrong, 
The Word of God gives order. I shared this a few weeks back, but I was praying over this message, and the Lord said, bring it up again. I want to read it to you. You can take your Bibles and turn to Matthew 18. In my Bible, this is red letters, which means Jesus himself is speaking. Matthew 18, starting in verse 15. Now, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you have gained your brother. But if he does not, then take with you one or two others, that by the testimony of two or three witnesses, every word may be established. If he refuses to listen to them... Tell it to the church. But if he refuses to listen to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. So let me talk to you, American church. I've had fistfuls of people over the 16 years I've been in ministry come to me because they're going to start coming to my church because they was going to another church and a preacher called them by name from the pulpit and just embarrassed them greatly and they don't want to be a part of no church that would do something like that. I have to tell them, well, I hate that you were embarrassed. I wasn't in the room, so I don't know the attitude or the heart that it was delivered in. But do you realize in the word of God, according to Matthew chapter 18, had the pastor come to you in private? Yeah, Had anybody else come to you about a matter? Yeah. Did you change it? No. Then according to the word of God, Jesus himself said, call them out in front of everybody. And if they don't listen then, kick them to the curb. Treat them as a tax collector and a Gentile. Do you realize in the temple, Gentiles were not allowed in the inner courts? No, you can't come in here. Not until you repent and change your ways. You need to go out there with the unbelievers. Then when you get it right, then you're welcomed in. Boy, Heidi. But yeah, but what about grace and mercy? What about love? The same Jesus that talked about grace, mercy, and love is the same Jesus that said, line them out. And if they don't listen, get them out your midst. I know that's a hard word, and I'm not... Looking to just open the... I told Frankie the other day, I said, (laughs) I probably shouldn't say this, but I'm going to. I said, I feel like the Lord has called me to open a new ministry. She said, what is it? And I said, open door ministry. I said, most people think that means open the door and let them come in. I said, I'm about to open the door and tell them they're free to leave. Open door ministry. Because here's the thing. I don't want nobody to leave. But I'm also tired of talking about lingering in the presence of God. I'm tired of praying about one day, hopefully, the glory of God is going to show up. I'm I'm tired of dealing with, oh, but God is still a God of wonders and miracles and he's going to do it. And then allow division, naysaying, and doubt to just set up shop on the front pew. Because here's the thing, God is not a God of disorder. He is a pure and a holy God. And he's only going to dwell in a pure and a holy vessel. Thank God for the shed blood that it is what cleanses us and makes us whole. But we need to get serious about the things of faith. Last week, uh, the brother couldn't go into detail, or he didn't go into detail. I wish he would have. But uh, when I was with them, because of the dangers that face the people of faith, When they're out witnessing, telling people about Jesus, and people show interest, 
They refer to them as seekers. They're seeking truth, but they've not accepted it. Then there are believers. Those are the ones who were seeking, but they've now made a declaration. They believe. And then there are the body. And you don't get to become the body unless they know without a shadow of a doubt you truly have been born again. There are evidences of your salvation that you are living the life that you are professing that you live. The reason is, is because there's a lot of people who's looking to infiltrate the church and destroy it in the natural. But the thing is, is you don't have to be in a closed country that's full of Muslims to have a demonic force that's looking to infiltrate the church to sow division and to terrorize what's going on. In the first two to three hundred years of the church, when you look at church history, they would go out in the highways and byways and they would witness and testify of the goodness of Jesus Christ. And when people would get saved out there, they would then begin courses, at-home groups, teaching them, this is what we believe. This is who Jesus is. And the churches that were being built during this time, there were three doors on the front. The one in the center is where the new Christians went. And there was a room at the back of the sanctuary that was closed off from the church. Just viewing windows, essentially. And the doors on the side brought you into the inner sanctuary. And if you were in the inner sanctuary, that is where you could partake of Holy Communion. Because you can't partake of the body and the blood of Christ unworthily or it might kill you. Paul warns about that. So to make sure that it was reverenced and taken in a holy manner, it sometimes was two to three years before a believer actually could partake in communion. Why? Because saying I believed in Jesus wasn't good enough. I know that burns the world up, but that's the Word of God. What? No, it's not. Yes, it is. Sure is. James 2 and verse 19. I'm getting ahead of myself, but it's all right. James says, you believe that there is one God? You do well. The demons also believe and tremble. Well, I'm a believer. Okay, cool. What are you doing? What are you doing? Are the fruits of the Spirit evident in your life? Are you doing the Word? James also warns to do the Word, to hear the Word, but not to do it. You've deceived yourself. So you can't even get mad at the devil. It's your own fault. Can't get mad at the preacher. Can't get mad at the devil. It ain't nobody's fault but my own that I heard the word, but I didn't do it. I deceived myself. Yet here we are in the good old Bible belt. Well, do they believe in Jesus? Do they? Every devil in hell believes. And it goes on in the word of God says the demons believe and tremble. So even the belief of the demons produces an action within the devil. Think about that for a second. What are we doing? I'm sorry that I have been, you know, wailing against the American church. They're going to take my American citizenship. Ha, ha, ha. I love America. I'm pretty patriotic. I'm not as patriotic as I used to be. 
I'll be honest. And it has nothing to do with me turning against America, but it has to do with me growing in my understanding of God. Because I've seen the presence of God stronger in a 99.4% Muslim country than I have in the good old Bible belt of the U.S. of A. I have seen the power and presence of God manifest in ways in Romania that I had never seen in America. I've seen it manifest in ways in Belize like I've never seen in America. I have sensed the presence of God on the Sea of Galilee like I've never experienced it in northeast Texas or southwest Arkansas. So we are God's country. Lie again. Because I've seen him and I've met him stronger on other soil than this soil. Because at least in those countries, they know they don't belong to God. We've been deceived. Because we've joined in with the devils and we've believed. But yet we don't do the word. We check off our religious box and come to church every once in a while. What's that got to do with anything? What are we doing? What are we doing? Are you telling me i got to earn my salvation? No, you couldn't. None of us can. Salvation is freely given. But it's going to cost you something to keep it. It's going to cost you something to keep it. <laughs> Romans six sixteen. Do you not know... That whom you yield yourself as slave to obey, you are slaves of the one whom you obey. Whether sin leading to death or obedience leading to righteousness. How do I get to righteousness, preacher? You better do the word. We got to be an obedient people. The sad thing is, is we've allowed bitterness and unforgiveness, public drama into the church. We handle things not according to the spirit, but according to the flesh. How many times have our public complaints kept someone from the church? How many times do we not handle things within the church because we're concerned about somebody running from the church? When Jesus tells us in Matthew 18, handle it. Handle it in private. Handle it with witnesses. Then make it public. And if none of those will work, treat them as Gentile and tax. Get the cancer out the house of faith. I know that's hard. That's a hard word. But it is the word. The word. It's not popular in America. It's not popular in fleshly driven world. But that's the problem in America. Is we listen to our flesh. And not the spirit of God. And God is coming back for a spotless and a pure bride. I know. I know what I'm saying is a hard saying. I'm glad that I got to preach it to me before I had to preach it to you. (laughs) But this whole idea, let's look back at verses 9 and 10. Let me read that to you. Do you not know, there it is the third time, that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. 
So let me pause there for a second. There are people who will not inherit the kingdom of God. Who? The unrighteous. So Paul, standing on the street corner, talking to all the Gentiles and tax collectors, said these words. No. This letter is addressed to the household of faith. He's talking about the unrighteous who was sitting on the pews. He's saying, you need to realize that some of y'all ain't going to heaven. And let me give you a list. Oh, preacher. Well, read the word. That's why it shocks the world when they hear the word. That's why it shocks the church because they ain't read the word. We read John 3, 16, For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And we can quote, All things are possible through Christ who strengthens me. We can quote, He's made me to be the head and not the tail. I shall go over and not under. We can quote, Oh, he has a hope and a plan and a future for me. That's the word of God. I'm glad you know it. But you also need to be memorizing that the unrighteous are going to hell. That only the obedient inherit the kingdom of God. You need to understand that don't just hear the word, but you got to do it too or you're deceived. You better hear the word. The whole word. There's two sides of this tension. And the gospel of quote unquote grace that has raped the American church over the last 30 or 40 years. Yes, he is a God of grace. Don't you mishear me. Yes, he is. But he's also a thrice holy God who is looking for a pure and a spotless bride. He is a God who has promised to indwell within us and empower us to be the holy people he is calling us to be. He has given us a promise that he would endue us with power from on high, that we can declare his word with boldness and walk and an authority. He's also knew there would be dissensions from within the church. And he said, make it plain and clear it up. point this out just extra in Matthew 18 when he's dealing with going to him and pub going to him in private going to him with the witness then taking it before the whole church do you realize the responsibility was always on the individual who it went to if they repented If they repented. If not, go to them again. If not, make it public. If not, get rid of them. See, the get rid of them part burns everybody up in this good old Bible belt because we've also believed the once saved, always saved lie that has run through our area. And so we can't fathom the idea that we have a God who says, wait a minute, I know you come to me by faith, but you have entered in by the way of the devil, and you are a worker of iniquity, and you are not pure, and you are not seeking my will, but your own selfish ambitions, and I loathe the presence of darkness. That's the heart of God. It's not that we have some mean God who's looking to whack-a-mole you and get you out of the kingdom. I think that's what some people think that I believe, is that God's just this angry God up here, you know, whack-a-mole, whack-a-mole, you know, just knocking us about the head. No, that's where grace and mercies come in. But when we continue to refuse grace and mercy, there comes a point in time when he says, if you're not going to repent, I can no longer dwell with you because you're no longer holy. And it's not him, it's us that refuse to be holy. Verse 9, do you not know the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do you, do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor the idolaters, nor the adulterers, nor male prostitutes, nor homosexuals, nor thieves, nor covetous 
nor drunkards, no revilers, extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. How is it that there are debates within what's supposed to be the church if it's okay to ordain and put a stamp of approval on sexually immoral people. I'm not talking about just homosexuality because the word's not talking about just homosexuality. Adulterers, all kinds of foolishness. He said, no, these will not inherit the kingdom of God, and yet we're trying to find a loophole how we can make them priests and kings over the household of God. What in the world? Why is it that even within our own general council of the assemblies of God, there's groups of people trying to figure out if the preachers can drink or not? Foolish. Foolish. Well, it says drunkard. Well, you tell me what's drunk and what's not. I'm not willing to find it out and go to hell. You might be able to drink five. You might only be able to drink one. Who's there to tell? Who's the judge on that? Do we got to go to the world and ask them what their breathalyzer says that's drunk? Paul addresses that. Quit going to the world for their opinion and go to me and hear my voice. (laughs) Do you not know... (laughs) Do you not know that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? I don't care what the LGBTQ plus ABCD elemental P says. They're out to get our children. And they're as bold enough to sing about it. And produce books to go into public school systems. And libraries and all these things. But we are so busy in our life with all this crap. And I said it. That don't even matter. That we don't have a clue what our kids are watching and listening to and reading. And then we wonder why they're just stolen from us and we think what in the world happened I guess Catherine's helping in children's church today I'm looking for she's so mad at me oh she wants a cell phone so bad with actual uh, service on it she's got my old cell phone and it's linked directly to my iTunes so every text she sends I see it Every text she receives, I see it. Every picture she takes, I see it. Every video she makes, I see it. Oh, she's mad about it. She sent a text here a while back. I'm not going to go into no details because it ain't nobody's business, but she sent a text. And I just saw it, and I thought about getting on to her in private. And I said, no, I'm going to just skip this whole thing. I'm going to do this right now. I entered in on that same text thread. I said, Catherine, change the topic. (laughs) Oh, she's mad. How embarrassing. (laughs) These little girls on here just talking about all kinds of foolishness. I just get off in the middle of their text thread that I ain't invited to. Girls. Talk about something else. Catherine, is that your dad again? Why does he have your phone? He don't have my phone. I'm a clone of his. He sees everything. OMG, that's so embarrassing. Uh, No, she ain't getting it because now I know the mess she'll talk about. If that's the mess they'll talk about, knowing I'm seeing it, what's going to be said if I ain't looking? Guess who ain't getting no cell phone ever as long as I got to pay for it? We've got to guard our children. 
I'm not worried what the world standard is because that's what my kids bring to me as an argument every time. But daddy, don't you know that such a, I don't care. You're going to have to find a chapter and verse if you're trying to convince me of something, honey, because I don't rightly care what nobody else's mom and daddy says. <laughs> and <laughs> I'm going to go with them. And boo, <laughs> you know. Uh, I <laughs> you have to keep on talking because you ain't convinced nothing yet. Let me deal with you just a little bit more about being doers of the word. 1 John 2, 4 says, Whoever says, I know him, and does not keep his commands, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. I ain't even got to give you no commentary on that one. I don't have to break that one down so you can understand it. John did pretty good under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Oh, you say you know him, but you ain't doing the word? You're a liar. The truth is not in you. I'm not concerned with having the popular church. I'm concerned with having the holy church. I am concerned with spending eternity with every one of you. We must return to holiness. We must understand that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of do you not know? But glory to God for verse 11. Such were some of you, but you were washed, sanctified, were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus by the Spirit of our God. Glory to his name. That you could be on that long list of the unrighteous that shall not inherit the kingdom of God. But Jesus has made a way. He has made a way that if we would call out on him freely, freely, salvation is available. Everything else I've just preached to you, that's for the ones who already believe. If you don't believe, if you don't know Jesus as Lord and Savior, it really is simple to start the walk of faith. All it takes is to say, Lord, I've realized that I need you. I've realized how broken and undone I am. Forgive me and be the Lord and Savior of my life. In that moment, the Spirit of God will begin a, a regenerative work within you, making you born again. Now, there are some things to come. You need to follow the Lord in water baptism. He tells us to do it. It's really not a suggestion. It is a command because it goes along with doing the Word and being obedient. Okay, you believed. Praise God. The devils in hell do that. Now you need to tell the world about what you've believed. That's the beauty of going in the death, burial, and resurrection and being raised in the newness of life. We've got to be doers of the word. We, we in America, we've made too much stuff suggestion. We've offered too much room for our opinion. Because that's the American dream.
I mean, I was watching a video by the late Dr. George Wood, who was a former general superintendent of the Assemblies of God. And he used the Ford Motor Company as an example. The first Ford that came out, it was offered in one style and one color. If you was going to get a Ford, it was going to be black, <laughs> and it was going to be what it was. There was no other options. And then I think the first seven to ten years, that was the only option, was black. And then they came out with like three other colors. You could get it in cream. You could get it in this brown. You could get it in a navy blue, or you could get it in black. And then now, now look at where we are. We got 37 shades of every color. Do you want a metallic chip or not a metallic chip? Would you like two-tone? Hey, if you don't like anything that we have to offer, won't you just go get a skin, and they'll just stick this plastic tape right over the top of your car, and you can make it look like a package of bubble gum or Skittles if you want to. You know what I mean? Eh, just whatever. You want cloth, you want leather. Which tone of which shade of leather do you want? You want wood grain? You, don't, you want real wood or you want plastic wood? Huh? You want this, you want that. How about this, how about that? What kind of wheels you want? What size wheels you want? What kind of tires you want? So on and so forth forth I mean we're guilty about it look at our church merch I give y'all like seven options of caps I had to narrow it down from the 750 that was available the thing is is that doesn't transcend into the gospel we don't get to pick what color and what shade and what sparkle we want we don't get to choose what verse is truth and what verse isn't. We don't get, we don't get those. Uh, there are no, uh, there's zero options. Oh, Henry Ford had it right in the beginning. Here you want it, here it is. You don't like this, you don't get it. Ain't but one option, truth. There's no Baptist and Methodist and Presbyterian and Pentecostal. It's the Word of God. Every bit of it. The whole thing. When you have to start coming up with man's theology to make your doctrine work. There is no white people gospel and black people gospel. No Mexican gospel. It's the gospel. Shame on us for thinking it's any other way. But the world, I don't care what the world says, and that is really the heart of today's message, is do you not know? Do you not know whom you serve? Do you not know who has paid for your eternity? Do you not know who has endued you with power? Do you not know who will be standing at the judgment seat? See, we crack so many jokes about going to the pearly gates and old St. Peter letting us in. <laughs> Won't you take your Bible and turn to Matthew 7? I'm going to close here. Matthew 7, verse 21. Again, Jesus speaking here. Talking about those of us who like to just say we believe. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven. But he who does... The will of my Father who is in heaven. I'll preach it in a second. 
Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, done many wonderful works in your name? But then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you worker of iniquity, you who practice lawlessness, you who practice evil. Talk about hard words. Who is it that enters into the kingdom of heaven? Those who do the will of the Father. Doers of the word. Say, yeah, but they did stuff. It says right down here that they prophesied and that they cast out demons and did many wonderful works. right he'll speak through a donkey huh he can do all kinds of things in his name because he holds the authority but then there's also this how many people are standing on the outskirts of the church looking in at the works of God and they would say, oh, you should have been at church Sunday. Man, God was there. There was all kinds of things took place. And they're standing over here. They ain't done nothing but watched. They didn't participate. They didn't enter in. They aren't doing the word. They were a spectator of the glory of God and somehow thought that was getting them to heaven. There is no bench time in the kingdom of God. This is war. And if we're not actively engaged in battle, we better be in training. There's no downtime. And the only way you're going to prepare for battle and train is know the Word of God. And as you begin to know the Word of God, the Spirit of God will quicken you to do what you're hearing and reading. I've never spent time in prayer and got up and decided, you know what, I don't have to do anything today. I've never got up from a place of prayer. Every time I've got up from a place of prayer, there's something within me that God has called to my attention. Something I need to repent of, something I need to put into practice, something I need to do. But He's cleansing me. Oh, sure, he'll encourage me too. But I get up thinking, oh, I need to pray more. Oh, I should have reached out to so-and-so. I should have made that phone call. I should have made that text message. I probably should have drove over there. I probably should have put some more action to my faith. I've not found this God who says just sit down and do nothing and just do whatever you want and I'll make it okay in the end. I hadn't found that God yet. I don't know what Bible other people find him in, but it ain't the one. They read in the book of the American laziness or something. I just hadn't found it. Do you not know whom you've been called to serve? Do you not know the authority and the power that he has released on your behalf? Do you not know? You do now. Now you have the responsibility, the personal responsibility to take the word and do something with it. That's between you and the Spirit of God. But he's calling you to do something. He's calling us to be a witness somewhere, some way. Amen. Thank you so much again for taking time to listen to a message from the sanctuary of Cornerstone Assemblies of God. We do this through the help of our listeners and friends in the community. If you would like to donate to our broadcast, you can go to cornerstoneatlanta.tv and give as the Lord would lead you. 
But again, I, Pastor Richard Wade of Cornerstone Assemblies of God, just say thank you for taking time, and I pray the Lord make this real to you today.